I heard a, a, a national um, public radio a broadcast about Tourette syndrome. It's pretty interesting. The guy claimed that Tourette's gets better with time, and a lot of the, the drugs you think are working could be could just got better on its own. I don't know if that has any merit. They talked about adult onset Tourette's. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe it. He thought they would probably have symptoms in their adolescent years, not diagnosed, and then someone was able to put the picture together later on. Are those two points valid? Yes. Well, this is the, 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 the answer to that. The first answer is, do medications really make a huge difference? The answer is, um, we think so. The trials aren't great, even in a Tourette's. You know, in Tourette's, in very severe Tourette's, there was a study, a double-blind study that done that was a little small back in the 80s that showed that one of the main drugs we use, cataprest, clonidine, doesn't work. Uh, we all... That was an evidence-based study. An evidence-based study. It was very small. It was, uh, it was borderline powered. And the, the only problem with that study was they were very severe Tourette's patients. And I think we all agree that that doesn't work. In milder cases, uh, cataprest and clonidine... Um, have an effect, but the, the and there's been data to suggest they do work. Uh, subsequently, pretty good data actually, pretty compelling data and evidence-based good studies. Uh, in very severe cases, they probably don't work terribly well. Uh, they don't make any. There's no evidence that these medications, for example, make any long-term difference. Uh, the major tranquilizer, specifically risperidol, is approved for Tourette's, um, and that does work. And there's evidence-based data that it works. Works it in, in, in making it a little bit more comfortable for the kids. That's to correct. Them? Only when they're on. Not, not cure it. It does not cure it at all, and it's only used as a symptomatic treatment if the ticks are affecting a child in school or socially, or they're hurting. Sometimes the ticks actually hurt the child. So there's really no evidence that that, that it that it makes a long-term difference. Furthermore, ticks are very complicated in that they come and go. So if I start you on a medicine and you're better. Is that the medicine or is it just stopping? It's very difficult. Uh, it's very common, for example, late August I get calls from kids' parents that have ticks, and they'll call, the ticks are worse. And the first thing I say, you know, we try not to treat children with ticks for that reason, uh, is let's wait till middle of, you know, middle of September and see what happens. And typically they get better by the time they get into class and things settle down. Uh, so that's always a, a peak uh, month for ticks, and I try not to treat them. So if I treated all those kids on August 20th, uh, you know, 80% of them are better by September 20th, and I would have said, gee, the medicine is wonderful, and, and it really has nothing to do with it. It's an honest medicine. answer. Uh, the, the, the second part of the question is actually interesting. We were always taught that ticks do not start after 18, age 18, and I'm not sure that's true. Uh, uh, and, and, but the problem is that a lot of people have ticks, and we don't know it. And, uh, 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 you know, even we, a lot, most of us have ticks, I think, of some sort, and the question is, what do you... Uh, you know, what, what was a tick and what wasn't. I think ticks can start in adulthood, but the, the dogma is that they do not. They don't start, they all start before age 18. So if you look carefully in the history, you probably would find an adult onset patient, you probably would find some indicator in adolescent there was something there, maybe not fully appreciated, so maybe it started there and it went down, it got quiet and came back later. That's the dogma, but we don't really know that. For example, I'll see children with ticks and Usually one of the parents will have ticks, and they never knew they had ticks. And one other thing they brought up, a lot of them have excessive compulsive disorders and Tourette's at the same time? People that have ticks or Tourette's, which is a compulsive motor movement, and if you have Tourette's, it's a compulsive motor movement with compulsive noises. Uh, typically, uh, I mean, you can have no other problems, but you are more likely than other populations to have attention deficit disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, so they can go hand in hand. So if you treat the excessive compulsive, which we do have some medicines for, yes. and improve that, do you improve the Tourette's too? Not usually. Uh, you can, uh, but it doesn't like, uh, we have medicines for obsessive compulsive behaviors. It doesn't usually improve the tics, although if the major problem is obsessive compulsive and the tics are a, are a reaction to the stresses of being obsessive compulsive, in that situation it will improve it. Same thing with attention deficit. Some children have a lot of attention deficit, and their tics are sort of secondary to their anxiety and their attention. We can treat the attention deficit, which typically most of the medicines that treat it, we think, aggravate tics directly. Uh, but sometimes kids' tics will go away once you treat the attention deficit because they'll feel more comfortable. Does behavior mod techniques help people with Tourette's? Um, there's not a whole lot of data that it does. Um, it, it can 
help some of the uh, behavioral, like the personality things, uh, you know, cognitive therapy or behavioral therapy. Uh, it may help kids understand what they have and realize how to deal with them. Because most children with tics can control them for certain periods of time and then they let them go, um, uh, you know, when they're at home or other places. So it can have some bearing, but it's not usually a major therapeutic intervention. A kid with Tourette's, sometimes the parents think the kid's faking it, and sometimes you related to a case, and they mentioned one on national public radio, the mother slapped the kid when the kid did, did the crazy movement, think the kid did it deliberately. Right. That's not the case, is it? I've had a couple parents in 30 years slap their children for ticks. We can understand how someone could think that way. Of course, it's wrong anytime you do it. Right. But you can see how they could think if you don't really have a trained eye. The kid is not really right. having a disease. The kid is acting. So some parents take it personally that my child has this terrible thing. And the reality is, ticks are very common, and for the most part, they're not. They're benign. They don't cause a whole lot of problem. So I think one, uh, you know, we've talked about this before. I think one has to really take a step back and uh, not just label everything ticks or Tourette's, and even if it might be by definition. And and most a lot most people actually do very well with these kinds of things. If a kid got a, a serious uh, overwhelming brain infection. Does Tourette sometimes follow it? Not really. Uh, usually Tourette's is not acquired. Um, uh, it's just it's something you're, you're, it's genetic. There was a question that was asked to me in some email and I didn't know of any link between a neurological bad infection, meningitis, and the kid had Tourette's afterwards. Uh, it's, it, it probably, there probably is some association, but in very a few cases, because technically you could come up with the reasons why it would happen, but it, it's it's usually felt to be a genetic predisposition. Is there any drugs you know are going to be coming down the road that might be potentially help the kid with Tourette's or nothing you know? Not that I know of. Well, there are multiple medications, but nothing curative, and they only suppress symptoms in the subset of kids, which is a small subset that have severe tics. But are you seeing more Tourette's today or less Tourette's today? I think it's about the same. I think it's been publicized for 30 years, at least in my lifetime as a doctor, and, and uh, people are, are pretty uh, efficient to coming to it. There are alternative therapies that people use. There's, there are acupuncturists that actually um, are, see themselves as Tourette specialists uh, uh, in the Chinese community. Do they uh, work? Does it work? Well, I don't, there's no data that it does, but uh, it might. Uh, that's never been studied. For or example. could it be that the kid was going to get better anyway and you did something? It's very hard to know. The, the dating with medicine is, is not terribly impressive and uh, it's only for a few medications. But acupuncture, as far as we know, can't hurt anybody. That's right. So if someone wanted to go to an acupuncturist uh, that is good at Tourette's, I think that's not, nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of can you afford it because it's probably going to be outside of insurance. And if you can, and I can't cure you. If you want to do that, that's fine. So in other words, you should always consult your primary care physician and make a decision with his, you know, some positive guidance. And what are it against some off therapies that don't hurt you? Yeah, you I think that's think right. That. But I think you have to be, I mean, I think some pediatric pediatricians and primary care physicians uh, may be. Uh, so you have to have one that's a little bit open-minded about it. But I think if you have an open-minded primary care physician, he or she can, you, you should be able to go to that person and say, gee, should I try acupuncture for my tics? And they can tell you, look, there's no downside. Uh, it may or may not work. If you want to do it, why not? Uh, if you want to chelate my child for tics, there is a downside. There's no data that it works. I wouldn't do it. And that would be sort of an inspired. So risk, um, benefit. I think it's a risk benefit, yeah. And people can't be dogmatic. Neither can the doctors, and some doctors are. So in other words, you make a decision, you sit down with all the people around you, and you say, well, this therapy won't hurt me, this therapy will hurt me. Or might. Yeah. Or may not. You yeah. don't know. And I think that's how you make the decision. And you should have an inspired primary practitioner that you can actually bounce this stuff off. I thank you very much. Thank you.